Welcome to the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage, where rude mechanicals do magic. Hello, I'm Bronze Age, Director of the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage, and today I brought my bayonet because we're going to be working on a bayonet lamp. Now I'm sure everybody is familiar with the big knife which has been put on the ends of rifles and guns as long as there's been rifles and guns. And uh, every bayonet has its own particular way of jamming on to the end of the rifle. In this case, we'll come in for a close-up look. There are two pieces of metal sticking out on the butt of this bayonet called lugs and uh, it would slide on to the end of the rifle where a straight piece would go into this groove right here and some kind of spring or something would snap over these lugs and hold it in place. And uh, that kind of connection to attach something semi-permanently has become known as a bayonet mounting. In the world of lamps and lighting, we have a lamp socket which is known as the bayonet socket because our bulb has these two lugs on the side and the socket has these slots are grooves where it can go in and it's held in place by a spring down in the socket. Now in the United States the bayonet socket was really only seen in 20th century automobiles. This was used for turn signals, brake lights, all that sort of stuff, but uh, never really got caught on in uh, residential lighting. This lamp is from Europe. And one thing I know about that is that uh, it was designed for 220 volt main voltage. And America is 110 main voltage for most lighting situations. What that means in the real world without going into the physics and the engineering is a bulb that burns of a certain brightness in Europe will burn half as bright if you bring it over to the United States and plug it in. Of course, there's a problem there is that the plugs aren't the same. So somebody took this lamp and they just simply cut the wires and put in an American cord with an American style plug. Now if the cord was properly wired and connected to this uh, bayonet socket, there's no real reason you can't use it in an American home. But in this case, the switch it's built into the socket, and that's worn out and no longer works. So, rather than find a European socket and replacing it, what we're going to do today is convert this over to an American style socket along with a new cord and uh, plug on the end. Now, this is the socket we're going to use, and that's where we come up with the first problem is I want to reuse this shell so that the lamp retains its original look. It has this fitter here for probably a kerosene lamp style chimney. And this pipe nipple here is much too big for uh, what we find in America, which is the 1 8 inch iron pipe threads. So I'm going to have to figure out some way to adapt this to this in a nice solid way where it's safe and uh, durable. Let's see what we can come up with for this trick. Now the immediate problem when you're trying to work on something like this is how do you hold it? It's a piece of brass, fairly soft, scratches easily. If you grip it too tightly it's simply going to crush. So we have to come up with some kind of fixture which will clamp this in place without damaging it. And usually what I fall back on is just a wooden block with a hole drilled through it. I can clamp it around the vise, I mean around the pipe, and put it in the vise. The vise will do it. Then I tighten everything down. And this should give me a fairly stable uh, workplace here. 
My first choice would be to enlarge the inside diameter of this pipe and then tap threads in it that would match the uh, 1 8 inch pipe. But unfortunately, I think this pipe's just a little too thin. If it was steel or iron, I might try it. But I think if I drill this brass out to the size where this will fit in it, it's just going to come into pieces. So that's not really uh, a good choice. Another choice would be to uh, grind this down so that it did fit on the inside and uh, hold it in place with either solder or epoxy. Now, there's a good chance of discoloring this with the heat required for solder, so epoxy is going to be plan A. So now we move over to the Packard Precision 12 speed drill press. I have this block clamped to the table and a short piece of pipe which is loose and able to roll. Got my piece of 1 8 inch pipe that I'm going to be machining down. And since it's going to be clamped in the uh, chuck, I'm going to put a little sleeve of, a loop of brass foil to hold it in place without eating into the uh, threads. At least that's the plan. Now that I've got it clenched down as tight as I possibly can, the plan is to run this file across it like this until we turn this down to a small enough size to go in the pipe on the lamp. Now this is the hole we've got to fit into. So I'm just going to keep filing until my calipers slip over the end of the pipe. Well, I think that is close enough for government work. Well, that looks pretty good. Now, what I'll do is cut it off at the height I need, apply a little epoxy to it, and tap it down in, let it sit overnight, and start back to work on this lamp in the morning. Okay, it's the next morning and I'm fully confident that the epoxy is totally cured. Now even though this does say quick setting epoxy, which starts to get pretty thick about two or three minutes into mixing it and fairly hard after about 15 minutes, I have found that even that is not really fully cured. And in a situation where something is going to screw down on top of this piece, and that gives you a tremendous amount of jacking force is that I want it to be at full strength as much as possible before I start putting it back together. And of course, right now we have to turn to another problem with uh, this conversion, which is the little slots where the switch went through. Really can't leave those open like that. So we have to have a solution to this problem. Now we're doing this for appearance sake, as well as safety. So we have to have a material which is going to match the light socket. And for that, I have a roll of brass foil. Stretch this out a little bit, and once it's in place, it will be a very nice match. I'm going to mix up some more of my quick setting epoxy, trim this a little bit more to get it to a better fit, and uh, this won't have to sit overnight because once it's in place, there's really no stress on it at all. Now it's time to uh, start putting this lamp back together. 
And this is where the details that distinguish a uh, good lamp job from a mediocre lamp job or a dangerous lamp job uh, come to the front. First up, we've got this cord bushing, a little plastic piece that uh, prevents the cord from getting scraped by bare metal. On lots of old lamps which have metal bases, some of them will go to rewire and this cord bushing is completely gone, missing, cracked a long time ago, and they run the cord through just bare metal. Uh, some of these can be very sharp, obviously a dangerous situation. So, cord bushing is a critical part of any good rewire. They don't cost much, and uh, it's cheap insurance. Now, running the cord back through the lamp presents two problems, complications, but they can be easily dealt with. The first is this socket and the shell that it's going to go in doesn't leave any room for the underwriter's loop or underwriter's knot, sometimes what it's called, which prevents the cord from being pulled down the, uh, sh the pipe here in case somebody trips over the cord and yanks the lamp off the table. So for that, we have to tie a knot right here so that it'll get caught on the cord bushing. Now, the second problem is where I put this little short piece of pipe in here, that's a narrow point, and uh, we have to figure out how we're going to get that through there. Because even though the wire will fit fairly easy, coming back the other way, it's going to hit that bottleneck and jam. So, the only really good solution to this is just simply to pull it from the bottom. If this were a regular lamp that had a pipe the same size all the way through, something this short, you can usually just push it all the way through and it pops out the top. One simple solution to this is uh, vinyl tubing sold in any hardware store, which goes down and just stick the two wires into it. And if you push as much as you pull, it will pop right out the top with uh, no trouble at all. I always put a uh, thread sealer anytime I'm putting a lamp back together. In this case I'm using the blue which is known as the semi-permanent. It can be taken apart with just regular tools as opposed to the uh, red which is called permanent and if you want to get something loose that you've sealed with red sealer you're going to need to heat it with a torch or else break something getting it loose. Now the advantage of this stuff is is that I can tighten this down hand tight and count on it staying tight because of the sealer. The problem with dealing with lamp parts in general is they tend to be small fairly lightweight and there's a limit to how tight you can get them before they start to deflect, start to bend, or maybe even crack or break. And you certainly can't get anything tighter after that. So the thread sealer is an important part of the assembly. All lamp cords sold in the United States have one side which is smooth to the touch, another side that you can feel a ridge on. The ridge side goes to a wide prong on the plug, the smooth side goes to the narrow plug, and this ensures it can only be plugged into the receptacle in one way. This is important because up at the lamp we have a brass colored screw and a silver screw. The wire with the ridge on it goes to the silver screw which then goes to the shell. And this is done this way to ensure that if someone were to put their hand up inside a lamp shade trying to turn on a lamp and the bulb was missing they would not be able to shock themselves by touching the shell. I don't know how often that actually happens but uh, that's how they deal with the problem in the United States. The smooth sided wire always goes to the brass colored 
screw. And of course, the ridged wire always goes to the uh, silver screw. Now this leads us to the problem of the good and bad practice. First thing I do is put a little blue sealer on these threads because when it's in place, I won't be able to get this really tight. There's nothing to grab hold of here. And now I have to do something that's really not a good practice. And that is I have to twist the wire while installing the socket. That's generally not a good thing to do because twisting wires is just, you know, bad practice. But in this case, I don't really have any choice. And the reason for that is because this lamp was not designed to have this socket. But once in place with the blue sealer, and I look to make sure that I've got my wire nice and clear, then I can move the knot up and uh, be assured that uh, the lamps, the, the uh, cord's not going to be able to be pulled out of the lamp. Candelabra sockets always come with a cardboard insulator that slides over it like that. And these fine threads are usually pretty fiddly to get fitted, but if you turn it backwards, it gets it lined up nice and straight, and it goes on easy. Then the fitter goes on, and it's got another nut goes down and holds it in place. And there we go. I will be installing a cord switch on this as soon as the customer calls me back and uh, tells me where they want it put. They haven't decided yet. This is Bronze Age for the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you found it informative. If you did, please uh, click the like button. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. I have a video coming out about once a week. I will probably have more light-oriented videos coming out soon. But uh, all of them have something in them that uh, you ought to find interesting. So, until next time, thank you very much.